We're here with Dr. James H. Austin, MD, author of the book Zen and the Brain. I'm a uh, retired neurologist, and I'm here at the invitation of uh, Professor Alioto to speak at the annual Schiffman Lecture on Religion. I was the beneficiary of a chance meeting with an English-speaking Zen master. And that was a rather special opportunity to learn about a rigorous style of Zen called uh, Rinzai. Zen. Rinzai. And um, before I met him, I was very curious as to what Zen was. And after that, I've been a student of Zen ever since. Now, you, you mentioned you studied Rinzai Zen. Yes. Uh, how is that different than the other system of Zen that's popular? Uh, Soto, is yes. it? Okay. Yes. Rinzai Zen is a little more uh, rigorous. And, uh, it's a little more <clears throat> oriented toward retreats that uh, concentrate on complete silence. And, and uh, occasionally, later on, uh, engage in riddles called koans. It started when Indian Buddhism was transplanted okay. into China, okay. and uh, it employs a uh, riddle that really can't be solved okay. by the intellectual logical sequences of one's thinking. Instead, <clears throat> it can be approached really only through insight, through sudden breakthroughs of the intuitive mind okay. after a long incubation. Okay. Now it is possible to study koans intellectually, and that's the usual way they are approached, uh, particularly in the West. Right. But in the, in the sense that they were developed in, in China, the koan gives you a situation in which you don't know the answer and you don't know it for a very long time. But as the result of meditation, and as a result of the dyadic relationship between the master and the, and the student, out of that dynamic situation can come a sudden breakthrough into the meaning and comprehension of the koan. I see. So there, but there, that takes years. Right. So you start early with a koan. You um, start not necessarily early, but okay. you start after you've arrived at a certain state of calm clarity. I see. Because you can't get into a koan without that. I see. Really. So as as the years go by, say as a Zen practitioner. Uh, working with a koan and not having the immediate meaning. Is yes. that simply an exercise in non-attachment? Uh, it's an exercise in, in not knowing and not coming to a premature intellectual understanding of a topic. Yes. And uh, basically you don't know what the topic really is. <clears throat> All you know is that there's this problem, this riddle, mm -hmm. and you incubate it and work with it, and it disappears, and then you work some more and come back. Mm -hmm. So this is a dynamic situation. It sounds almost like you're describing life in general from a Buddhist perspective. Exactly. Okay. And uh, many people regard daily life practice of Zen as just that, as an ongoing koan practice in coming to grips with the vicissitudes of daily life okay. and probing and trying to understand uh, what is really going on. Let's move into a little more modern idea. Could you physically or even chemically describe enlightenment in scientific terms? Uh, not in the space of this particular interview. <laughs> However, uh, if you're interested in some of the dimensions of the problem, of the question you're asking, uh, I've tried to I've tried to uh, write about these in the three books that are in front of you. Right. 
and in the fourth book that will be coming out in 2011. Okay, so you have another book coming out. Do yes. you have a title for that yet? It's called uh, Meditating Selflessly. Okay, Meditating Selflessly. And uh, it's an effort to take what is in the, these three books and condense it into principles that can be helpful to the average person who is meditating on the mat and on the cushion. Right. And who is trying to take this mode of attentiveness out into daily life. What sort of scientific research would you like to see perform in regards to meditation from now forward? In a nutshell, I can briefly say that what is really lacking is a long-term longitudinal neuropsychiatric and neuroimaging study of Zen training. By longitudinal, I mean something that is repeated at intervals for many years, not just a few days. And what we're really looking for is a multidisciplinary approach that involves both psychological principles and physiological findings to determine where and what happens uh, in the brain as it gradually becomes trained to pay, attentive, pay attention to what is going on inside and outside. And the, and the functional anatomy of the brain as it's revealed by, let's say, functional MRI imaging or structural MRI, which you mentioned, uh, magnetoencephalography, <clears throat> and any new techniques that tell us more about how the brain changes, because meditation is an agency of brain change. It's called the plasticity of the brain. That uh, some of the pioneering studies uh, were accomplished and are still going on at the University of Wisconsin in Madison oh. with uh, Richie Davison and Antoine Lutz and their collaborators. And some of the other basic research on brain imaging had been going on here in St. Louis uh, with uh, Mark Rakel okay. and his group. And after this momentum developed, there is now meditation research going on in a number of important centers in Europe okay. and also in Beijing in China. So Great. I'm going there in another couple of weeks and try to find out what's going on in Beijing. Great. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning, Jeff. Hey, good morning. Thank you.